Hi, I'm Vincenzo Coya, and welcome to Staff 545, the video series designed to help you write a clean and modern data analysis. Remember how we've been saying that a tibble in its columns hold vectors? Well, it turns out that they can also hold lists. And because lists can hold anything, that means that a tibble can hold anything too. And this opens up a world of possibilities when it comes to a data analysis, because we can now hold things like linear models, probability distributions, you name it, in a tibble. But the flexibility of lists comes at a cost, because they're harder to calculate with. You can't even add or subtract anything to a list. So today's topic, we're going to be looking at the per package in R to help you do calculations more easily with lists. And by the way, if you need a refresher on what vectors and lists are, take a look at episode 13a. And as in that episode, I'll be referring to atomic vectors as simply just vectors in this episode. The first method is to iterate using the map function. Just specify your input list or vector, as well as the function that you want to apply to each component of that list or vector, and map will then iterate that calculation and give you a list as an output with all of those calculations in it. In this example, I'm starting with a vector of paths, each pointing to a CSV file for the number of words spoken in each of the three Lord of the Rings movies. I'd like to read them all into R. We can't just use read underscore CSV to read in these files, because this function isn't vectorized. It doesn't repeat the operation on each path. Instead, we can use the map function from the per package. We end up getting a list of three tibbles, corresponding to the original vector of three paths. To get this list of tibbles, the map function just iterated the read underscore CSV function on each path. Let's do another calculation, this time on the list of tibbles, filtering each tibble to only include elves. First of all, notice that we're piping a list into the map function, whereas before we were entering a vector into the map function. Second of all, any arguments that come after filter are actually placed inside of the filter function. The longer and more cumbersome way to do this is to define a function on the fly. But thankfully, we don't need to do this because map provides us with that handy shortcut. Although, if you do need to make a function on the fly, the map function has yet another shortcut. Just replace function x with a tilde and use dot x to refer to the function argument. Or you can use dot dot one instead of dot x meaning the first argument of your function. If you're used to writing for loops, you might think that the map function is totally unnecessary. But the map function is more specific than a for loop and forces us to be deliberate about what the input vector or list is and what the output list is going to be. This makes for readable, pipeable, and just more robust code. The second method for calculating with lists is to extend the map function. So the map function actually forms a foundation for an entire family of map functions, which allows you to be intentional about what the input and output vectors and lists are. For example, here I've calculated the mean and variance of the body mass of each penguin species. You can find the data set in the Palmer penguins package. What if I wanted to form a normal distribution for each species of penguin using these means and variances? First of all, let's use the dst underscore norm function from the distplyr package to make a normal distribution. Here's an example with mean 0 and variance 1. To iterate this over two vectors, one for the mean and one for the variance, I can just use the map2 function, this time putting the two vectors first, followed by the function I'd like to iterate. But because we did the mapping in the mutate function, the resulting list of distributions was put as a column in our tibble. Watch as I extract this distribution column to show you that this column is in fact a list. So far we've only used the map functions to output a list, 
But vectors are so much more lightweight and easier to work with. What if we wanted to output a vector if we could? How would we do that? For example, I can convert our original normal distribution into a number by calculating its 25th percentile. Going back to our penguins example, we could use the map function to do this calculation on all three distributions, but map always outputs a list, and so we end up with a list column containing single numbers. Not ideal. Instead of map, use the map underscore dbl function to output a numeric vector. The dbl stands for double, which is basically the technical name for a number. But you can't use an output that doesn't make sense, like asking for a vector of logical values, or LGL, simply because our calculations aren't either true or false. If you're used to the apply family of functions in base R, like s apply and l apply, the map family of functions are very similar, except they force you to be more deliberate about what your input and output are, which ultimately make for less surprises in your code and therefore more robust code. The third method for working with lists is to nest and unnest. Now, probably the most important list columns in a data analysis is when you have a list of tibbles. And in this case, you have two special actions that you can do here, nesting and unnesting. For example, let's use the inframeQuantile function from the displyr package to calculate more than one quantile on our original normal distribution. We end up getting a tibble of these three quantiles. Now let's run in frame quantile for each of our distributions in the penguins example, instead of calculating a single quantile like we did before. We end up getting a list column of tibbles. What if we wanted to expand those embedded tibbles, incorporating them into the main tibble? We can use the unnest function from the tidyr package. Just tell it what column you'd like to unnest. Notice that as each embedded tibble expands, the corresponding row gets duplicated until it matches the number of rows of the embedded tibble. This process stays in alignment with the definition of tidy data, where each row is an observation. While the unnest function expands embedded tibbles to incorporate them into the main tibble, the nest function does the opposite. It takes chunks of your tibble and compresses them down into embedded tibbles in a list column. For example, what if we wanted to randomly sample five countries from the Gapminder tibble, which has data on 142 countries? In this case, I'd like to have only one country per row. To do that, I'll have to compress all the other columns into a tibble for each country. This is exactly what the nest function does. Just specify which columns you want to appear in the embedded tibbles, and all the other columns act as grouping variables, so that there's one embedded tibble per group. In this case, the country column is the grouping variable because it doesn't appear in my column specification. We can also select columns using tidy select. Now that each country is in its own row, I can easily take a random sample of five countries by sampling five rows. And now to go back to the original format, we just unnest the data column. Well, I hope I've inspired you to use list columns in your data analysis and to break down any barriers when it comes to calculating using lists. First, Iterate using the map function. Second, extend the map function. And third, use nest and unnest. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As always, join us next time, where this time we'll talk about bundling your functions together into your own R package. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel. I really want to help you write a clean and modern data analysis. And subscribing is really the best way for you to keep up to date with these videos. See you next time.